All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of uh, O365A. Um, today's episode, we're going to be talking about the new Skype for Business Server 2019 public preview, and I'll ask uh, Michael to lead us off. Yeah, so the, the announcement was that, you know, all the Office server products kind of released their preview versions for 2019. So you have your Exchange 2019, your Skype for Business 2019, and uh, SharePoint 2019. So when we're talking about voicemail, uh, Skype for Business, Server 2015, and, and you know, Link 2013, uh, they use, you know, they can leverage Exchange Unified uh, Messaging. Uh, but now in Exchange 20, Exchange Server 2019, the Unified Messaging or UM role has been uh, removed. So this gets, uh, this gets a little interesting. So now if you're, you know, deploying Skype for Business Server 2019, and your users are, uh, your mailbox users are on Exchange 2019. They're going to be leveraging cloud voicemail services. So it's, it's had a few different names. Uh, it's been like Azure voicemail services, uh, you know, uh, cloud voicemail, Office 365 voicemail. So you're going to now be, uh, you know, you might be all on premises with your servers, but you're going to be leveraging a cloud service for voicemail. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't still use unified messaging if you're Exchange 2013 or Exchange 2016. We can, we can leverage that UM role. Uh, some of those, you know, some of your old environments would leverage Exchange unified messaging online. So it's going to be a little bit different now. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a check when you are sending voicemail to Exchange online. And if your user is home to Skype for Business uh, Server 2019, it will actually flip over and use Azure Voicemail behind the scenes. So they are trying to uh, make sure that you're not using that unified messaging role for the newer versions of the products. I think, uh, Dino, you want to cover the call monitoring? Yeah, for sure. So... Um... This is a feature, the, the, uh, data, the cloud call data connector. It's a bit of a, a bit of a mouthful. Um, but the call, the cloud call data connector really is, uh, call analytics that they've moved up into the cloud. So what's happening now is that each of the front ends in your pool will start to take the call quality metrics and ship them up to the cloud. So, um, when this is, this is actually really the, is a feature that I'm excited about because, um, it exposes the uh, the new, you may have seen it, the advanced call quality analytics. So it's taking that data and allowing your on-prem users to uh, leverage that. So you can now go up into the cloud and look at the advanced call quality analytics. Uh, and soon you'll be able to search it in, uh, you know, the modern portal as, as more and more of the functionality is converted over into the modern portal. So really this is going to give you that nice, clean view of your call data um, you know, be able to look up a user, I see their device system and connectivity metrics and be able to quickly determine why the, the call quality may have been poor um, in a conference or just in a two-way call, for example. Um, you know, th this also means that, you know, you don't have to deploy archiving and monitoring locally. You still can. There's no um, requirement to do so. If you have third-party vendors that leverage that need to leverage that, you can still, by all means, deploy the on-premise based uh, 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 call uh, data metrics and reporting, but you don't have to do that. As well, um, it was announced that uh, call quality dashboard will also be made available. It's not quite ready yet, but uh, expect to see that to be made available for 2019 soon. Um, so really that's, you know, in a nutshell, um, the ability to, to, uh, to look at, to leverage the, the on-prem users data. That was a, that's a, that's a welcome feature in my opinion. Yeah. And then, uh, in addition to what Michael was mentioning with regards to, um, to, I guess, voicemail, um, so currently you can utilize the new feature or the feature that's been there as uh, cloud auto attendant if you're currently um, hosting users in Skype for Business Online and utilizing the PSTM connectivity there. So you can have a, uh, an auto attendant built in the cloud um, 
you know, for, for your business purposes. So the new feature that's going to be coming out that's not really, uh, that hasn't been uh, released yet is you'll have the ability to utilize the Skype for Business Server 2019 along with the cloud auto attendant. So you can route calls from internally through your Skype for Business Server environment via hybrid connectivity and syncing, um, you know, the contact objects through Azure Active Directory um, into Office 365 and then have your cloud auto attendant built there. So there's no need uh, to have one built on-prem utilizing Exchange. As Michael mentioned, if you move to Exchange 2019, then the UM and auto attendant functionality is going to be deprecated. So. Uh, we're moving into an area where the, the cloud is going to be leveraged more for on-prem services. So, how do you think that, uh, you know, with the move to being able to consume the cloud auto attendant and call queues that you know, maybe RGS will get a little less used or maybe some people that are building RGS uh, uh, workflows might move that towards uh, the cloud services? Yeah, I think that's I think that's definitely the area that's um, I think that's going to come next. Um, obviously, RGS uh, is is pretty sophisticated in the things and routing and capabilities that you can utilize it for. Um, you know, for instance, I've built some for um, you know for calls for call centers internally, small call centers internally, but then building these different schedules to route to. Um, third-party contact centers and stuff like that. So uh, these are obviously some applications that a customer would want to ensure that the you know the call queues and the auto attendant uh, in the cloud can be able to uh, can be able to do. Um, and then uh, another uh, you know I guess uh, a feature that that's being added is. Uh, um, is the ability to streamline a migration from a user uh, in the Skype for Business server on-prem to Teams directly. So there's not, no need to uh, move them to Skype for Business Online and then from Skype for Business Online move them to Teams. You can directly um, do that move from Skype for Business uh, Server 2019. And in that move, it will also um, move their uh, their meeting experience and their URLs um, in, in that particular move. So, um, and then uh, just before I pass it over to Curtis, I, I do want to mention that the um, the migration path for a 25, 2015 to 2019 is a side-by-side -side migration. Uh, because of the requirements of Skype for Business Server 2019 requires uh, Windows Server 2016. Uh, there is no in-place upgrade like there was from a link 2013 to the Skype for Business Server 2015. So, um, in doing this deployment, you, you're going to have to, you know, purchase net new uh, server hardware uh, and then perform the migration uh, as per documentation. And uh, pass over to Curtis. Yeah, thanks, Abib. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, along with the uh, lack of support, I guess, for in-place upgrades, uh, there's a couple other pretty significant things that are deprecated in uh, Skype for Business Server 2019. Nothing hugely significant I see. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones is uh, persistent chat goes away. So, of course, persistent chat was that uh, separate ro role that allowed uh, Skype for Business to have a, a chat-like experience. Um, of course, I'm sure Microsoft would uh, like you to move to Teams for that now. That's exactly what, what Teams is, is built for. So that's not supported in server 2019. Um, SQL mirroring, uh, the, that won't be supported in server 2019 either. So for uh, high availability and disaster recovery uh, for the backend database, you'll have to look at some other options like uh, SQL Server Always On or uh, Failover Clustering. Um, there's also the, the old mobility service, which was uh, an external web-based uh, protocol basically that serves some legacy mobile clients. That's, uh, that's being deprecated too. So that shouldn't be an issue. I think the mobile clients that use that service were, were quite old dating back to the link 2010 days. So unless you have a lot of, uh, uh, legacy mobile clients, that shouldn't be a, a big issue. The other thing is the XMPP gateway, which was used to federate, uh, Skype for business with some 
outside systems like uh, I think it, it provided Federation with some Cisco Jabber and uh, possibly some other systems out there. Uh, it's it's support for it's going away too. So if you have any Federation with XMPP, you'll want to drill into that. Uh, that's about it. That's the significant um, stuff. As Habib said, uh, Server 2019 is only supported on Windows Server 2016, so you're going to have to size your, your hardware appropriately. Yeah, I mean, there's also that you're not going to be able to deploy the the on-premises call quality uh, methodology dashboard, right? Right. Uh, so you have to leverage that that online one that Dino was talking about. And yeah, just C- a side CQD note, and CQM. Yeah, and then a side note on the MCX or the mobility service, I believe the old Mac 2011 clients used that. So there's some organizations that were holding out on that client maybe because of file transfers. I can't remember what the, the biggest driver for keeping that client around. Uh, so, so there might be a, a forced Mac client refresh uh, with that. And then, uh, sorry, one thing on the always on, I think the licensing also requires SQL Enterprise. So that's quite a big cost jump from being able to do SQL mirroring and having that kind of HA uh, level SQL backend and now going to always on and having enterprise licensing. Uh, there's there's going to be some cost there. Yeah, good points. Uh, what One of the benefits I see with this data connector for the analytics is um, – You'll now be, be able to get a single pane of glass in terms of if you're in hybrid mode, you'll be able to see your your on-prem call quality uh, records and call quality records of your uh, online users all in one place. So, That's right. We we didn't have that until just you know before you just had to look at them separately. So um, it's definitely a welcome a welcome feature. Yeah, I, I think the the modern portal for Office 365. I, I still think there's some work there. You know. The ability to have like trending or even a dashboard for that call analytics instead of having to hop into CQD and see yeah. non, it's like you kind of get the high level view, but it's, if you get to see like, hey, I, where are my bad calls for the last hour, right? And that's it's a little hard in the portal today because you have to know who was involved in the call and then drill into that user and then you can see all their calls. Uh, but having some, some dashboards over that would be quite powerful like they did on the, the monitoring database on premises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely hope they continue to evolve that in the cloud because they're on the right track. Um, it performance is a bit of a problem, uh, trying to, like you said, Michael, uh, find the needle in the haystack. It's a lot of clicking, drilling in and, um, doesn't always perform really snappy in the web browser. Uh, so hopefully it, uh, that continues to improve. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that they also include the um, the CQM um, utility, you know, the one where you can export the data and then um, you know browse it uh, with the Excel template. That provides a lot of really good insight uh, with regards to call quality and, and subnets that have issues within your network, devices, uh, you know, top X users that are having problems. So I'm hoping that they'll uh, they'll also include that that functionality. That that is tremendous in figuring out uh, call quality uh, call quality problems. Absolutely, yeah. Hopefully, uh, I mean, it's they've reported that it's not going to be supported the current incarnations, but hopefully they'll you know update the spreadsheet and or allow us to allow you to dump the data from the cloud uh, in a in a you know in the format that CQM can the new C version of CQM can use possibly because that that is absolutely a valuable tool. Or even if you could tie it into Power BI, right? And then you just have it pull right from the cloud to the cloud and do your reporting from that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to throw this one out there. So (laughs) Exchange Unified Messaging removed from Exchange Server 2019. Uh, Third-party PBX support for Exchange Online going away July 2019. Uh, if you're homed on Skype for Business Server 2019 and using uh, a mailbox in the cloud, you're using Azure Voicemail. What, what do you think on uh, unified messaging in uh, Exchange Online? What the, what the timeline is that? Is for that? You know, those 2015 environments. Maybe it's when that end of mainstream support or thinking. I think it'll be end of the mainstream support for Exchange 2016, right? I mean, because that's really. 
the product, the last product that will, that currently supports it, right? And has the roles included inside it. So I think once that is done, so it'll probably, what, what's the new support system five and five and two or, or just, this is the five? Yeah, that, that, for sure. Like that's another key, another key thing is that, uh, end of life support for extended support for both 2015 and 2019 will actually end on the same date. So, which is 2025, because they're moving from five, a five and five mainstream uh, and extended to a five and, and two. So while, you know, moving to 2019 server gives you the, a couple more years or three more years of, you know, mainstream support, you'll have effectively both products being end of life. Um, in 2025. So that's inter that's interesting to consider. Yeah, but do you think they would keep the cloud version of unified messaging around for the whole life period of extended support or just mainstream support of the 2016 products? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to say my guess would be if you ask me, you know, since you're asking is that it, if they have to kind of keep it around till 2025 to coincide with that end of end of life support. But, you know, what do you guys think? You had to pick a date. I think with the advancements in quantum computing by 2025, <laughs> we'll just know what we're each other's thinking. We'll have to yeah. communicate. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would be surprised if the unified messaging can last to 2025. That's that's a long time. That's I, just, I would too. Yeah. I, I would see them finding a way to for the legacy products, those that are like 2013 or Skype for Business Server 2015 that are using uh, online mailboxes to somehow shimmy in Azure voicemail as well in the next couple of years, so that the emphasis on unified messaging in the cloud is greatly reduced. Yeah, there'll definitely have to be some sort of migration plan for them, right? I think there'll be something, maybe something to come out within the coming years. But as of now, I I'll stick with the 20. Speculation, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, great session. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in, and uh, hopefully you'll uh, catch us on the next one. Take care. See you. See you.